Our uh, lecture today, uh, lecture number 42, is on uh, brain lateralization, meaning the split brain. And uh, we'll also be taking a look at the um, at attentional processes, and in particular, we'll be taking a look at uh, uh, attention deficit uh, disorder. So uh, quite a bit that we want to try to cover uh, today. So let's begin. Uh, when we take a look uh, at this area um, of, uh, of what we refer to as the split brain, uh, I think that it's important to recognize that uh, you know uh, this is an area that um, uh, we've known about uh, for a while. Uh, that there's been some you know interesting research that has been done. Uh, and uh, not only is this work important for understanding the functioning of the brain, but it's also very important, uh, as we will see, for, for understanding uh, attentional processes uh, and also important for understanding uh, language. So, uh, you know, let's, let's begin our uh, assessment in this area. Uh, when we talk about this concept of lateralization, we're really referring to the idea that the two hemispheres of the brain, and uh, here's our two hemispheres here, here's our left hemisphere, here's our right hemisphere, uh, they really look as though they're mirror images of each other, but uh, what we've come to learn uh, in the field of uh, behavioral neuroscience is that they really have uh, different functions. You know, each hemisphere controls what we call the contralateral or opposite side um, of the body. So um, here is a good visual that I want you to keep in mind. You know, here's our two hemispheres that we see here. Here's the left hemisphere. Here's the right hemisphere. Um, and um, if we were to split apart or try to split apart the, the two hemispheres, we couldn't um, because of this structure that you see here, which is called the corpus callosum. Uh, the corpus callosum is this very diffuse uh, uh, pathway system uh, uh, of neural pathways that connect the two hemispheres uh, of the brain. So um, what happens then ordinarily is that uh, information uh, is being transferred all the time uh, between left and right hemisphere. Uh, and this is um, uh, done primarily by way of the structure called the corpus callosum. So again, information is crossing over to the other hemisphere um, uh, after you know just a brief delay. So information that comes into the right hemisphere gets transferred to the left. Information that comes in the left hemisphere gets transferred over to the right. That's a normal course of events that occurs uh, in the brain. Um, again, here's another view. Um, this is a frontal uh, view that you see here uh, of the corpus callosum. Um, and um, the, uh, the hippocampal uh, commissure as well as the uh, uh, posterior commissure and the anterior commissure. <clears throat> this is in this mid-sagittal section of the brain that you see here. And, and again, these are uh, very important uh, for um, uh, information relay uh, between the two hemispheres of the brain. Um, some essential facts regarding um, lateralization. The two hemispheres, once again, look like they are identical to one another, um, but uh, they are not. Um, they are uh, very different in terms of the basic functions that they subserve. There's a division of labor. Uh, the left side, um, which is typically the dominant hemisphere, that's with a person who's right-handed, and most of us are right-handed. Um, that's specialized for speech and for language. The right hemisphere, the minor hemisphere, uh, typically is specialized for things like emotion, perception, monitoring functions. Um, so you would just reverse these things in the case of a person who is uh, left-handed, where the right uh, hemisphere uh, would be the dominant hemisphere and would be specialized for speech and language. 
Um, so when we make reference to these things as we go along, uh, again, because most of us are right-handed, that's what we'll be uh, referring to uh, as the left side, uh, the left hemisphere being the dominant hemisphere. But again, you can just reverse these things in the case of a person uh, who is uh, left-handed instead of being right-handed. Uh, the corpus callosum is allowing uh, the brain hemispheres access to information from uh, both sides uh, of the brain. That's a, a very important function uh, that it's served. Uh, I want to talk about uh, a quite famous uh, experiment in this area, one that was conducted by Roger Sperry at Harvard University a number of years ago. Uh, in which he performed um, a split brain uh, procedure in cats where he cut the corpus callosum, the transection, as you see here, okay? transection of the corpus callosum and, and of the optic chiasm. So what he does is he takes this cat and uh, the cat has a blindfold placed, in this case, upon its right eye. Uh, and when you show the cat a visual stimulus, uh, what is going to happen is that visual stimulus is only going to go uh, to the left uh, hemisphere and it's up in the striate cortex, as you see here. Ordinarily, uh, what would happen is that if this had not been cut, that information not only would go to the left hemisphere, but it would go to the right hemisphere as well. So please keep that visual in mind uh, as we take a look at these very famous split brain experiments that he conducted. Uh, here is uh, this uh, really breakthrough split brain study that he performed some years ago. And let's take a look at this first in terms of the control group. Um, here you have an animal uh, that has not had no uh, surgical manipulation, no split brain. Uh, there is a blindfold place on its right eye. And what we're going to do is we are going to teach uh, this uh, uh, cat um, a, a visual discrimination where it's going to learn to respond uh, to uh, this rectangle that you see here one way and this circle another way. So again, this is a, a classic um, uh, uh, stimulus uh, discrimination uh, experiment. So uh, take a look at the performance uh, of this animal here. They're starting out at a level of 50%. Um, but what you see is that the animal uh, gets better and better and better uh, and better to a point where they're performing at 100% right here. That is, they're making all correct um, answers in this uh, uh, visual discrimination. Um, but then what Sperry does is this. Uh, he now removes the blindfold from the right eye, puts it on the left eye, uh, and he asks the question, uh, does the animal know the visual discrimination uh, that has been taught? And sure enough, uh, when we uh, start in our procedure again with the visual discrimination, you can see that the animals just pick up where they left off. Again, the patch now has been placed upon the other eye, uh, and we can see that they're performing at a level of 100%. So that's our control group. In our experimental group that you see here, um, the blindfold is placed over the right eye. Now the animal uh, has had a surgical uh, manipulation where the corpus callosum and the optic chiasm have been cut. So uh, this is what the level of performance looks like in this visual discrimination. Again, the animals get better and better and better with practice. This uh, curve that you see here, uh, where eventually they're performing at 100%, is identical to what you see here. Okay, Again, identical curves. But now here's the interesting part. What Sperry then did was this. He took the blindfold, placed it upon the left eye now, so now the right eye is open. And what he's going to do is he's going to see how the animal performs in the visual discrimination and take a look. The animal now has to learn this response all over again. Okay, so again, here's an acquisition of this. 
compare this to what we see here. And our conclusion then absolutely has to be that ordinarily information is passed by way of the corpus callosum to both hemispheres as it is in this control condition that you see here. Once you have eliminated that, however, what we see is that information is only going to the to the uh, trained hemisphere, the one where the eye is open, uh, and indeed you know, with the blindfold on the right hemisphere, uh, there's no information now that is getting transferred. So again, that's why the animals have to start all over again. This was really a crucial uh, step uh, in understanding the functioning of the brain and how important the corpus callosum ordinarily is for the passing of information between uh, the two hemispheres. Um, and then comes along another researcher by the name of Michael Gazaniga, who does the same very interesting experiments, uh, split brain experiments uh, in uh, humans. And uh, what he does is he works with epileptic patients uh, who are experiencing severe uh, epileptic seizures. Uh, what he does is he cuts the corpus callosum in order to eliminate those, those seizures. So it's a last resort kind of procedure. Um, and what he finds later on in terms of the behavior of these individuals following the split brain is that it's, for all practical purposes, has created two separate minds in the same body. Uh, and his uh, experiments uh, are really, you know, really fascinating ones. So again, some of the essential findings in, in the split brain uh, in, in humans, if you take a look at a common behaviors um, that don't really require an awful lot of cortical input, those common behaviors don't seem to be impacted uh, when uh, uh, the, uh, when the individuals had a, a corpus callosum uh, cut. So things like walking or tying shoes, so those are things that don't re really require cortical input. So those behaviors, those common behaviors, are not impacted at all by the cutting of the corpus callosum. But unfamiliar behaviors, behaviors that really require a lot more cortical input, those behaviors are greatly impaired. Things like threading a needle, for example, which is quite difficult um, to do, uh, requires a, a high level of motor uh, coordination. Um, the left hemisphere is specialized for language. Split brain people can't really describe information. Um, uh, uh, they can only describe information uh, if it enters the left uh, hemisphere. That's in a split brain person. They can describe information only if it enters the left hemisphere. If it only enters the right hemisphere, they cannot do that. Uh, split brain people have separate fields uh, of awareness. It's two separate minds in the same body. And this is revealed in very simple things like, for example, in the case of a man, uh, who's uh, pulling up his pants, uh, um, uh, putting his pants on uh, in the morning. Um, uh, and typically what happens is, um, again, this person uh, being right-handed, uh, they'll use their right hand uh, in order to um, uh, zip up their zipper, for example, uh, on their pants. Um, but what uh, immediately happens uh, after that is that their left hand comes down and unzips the zipper. Again, it's as if there's no coordination between the two hemispheres um, of the body. Um, so again, the abilities that display cerebral lateralization of function are listed here. And the, the ones that I uh, in particular want to, uh, uh, want to emphasize is that uh, certainly um, this the primary language functions uh, that's uh, we see that in the left hemisphere speech reading writing um, mathematical abilities um, uh, on the other hand um, spatial abilities that's something that typically we see in the uh, right hemisphere uh, rotation or shapes, uh, geometry, direction, distance. So for a right-handed person, this is what we would typically see. Uh, again, just reverse these things if you were looking at a left-handed person.
Um, I also want to talk about another um, pioneering older uh, scientist by the name of Wilder Penfield. Um, Penfield, uh, for many years, uh, was at um, uh, McGill University in the hospital at McGill University. And he was one of the first ones to begin to explore the brain in terms of stimulating the brain in, in uh, very uh, precise locations and exploring what happened in terms of the behavior of human beings once that area of the brain was stimulated. So the, the surface of the brain then is being probed with an electrical stimulator. Um, these are individuals uh, in which that brain tissue has been exposed by uh, removing part uh, of the skull. Uh, and uh, the patients are under uh, local anesthesia. So what he does is he records a map uh, of the patients, uh, the, the location where they stimulated, uh, and the experiences, uh, the feelings uh, that they report. So for example, take a look um, at this figure that you see here. Again, this is research that was done back in the 1940s and early 1950s. Um, and you can see these various spots um, that are being stimulated and um, the kind of responses that are produced. So, for example, this area 24 being stimulated by an electrical probe. What you see is the patient tried to talk, uh, but their mouth moved, but they didn't make any, uh, any sound at all. Uh, if you see uh, this area 25 right here, if that's stimulated, the patient said, oh, I know what it is in response to a picture of a foot. Uh, that is what you put uh, in your shoes. Uh, after the termination of the stimulation, that individual said foot. Um, take a look at you know some other areas of stimulation uh, area number one that you see here um, the person experiences tingling in the right thumb and, and slight movement um, so again it, he's the first one to really map out um, what is happening when you probe uh, parts of the brain uh, electrically so again he puts a numbered card uh, place on the brain during surgery in order to mark the sites where the brain stimulation had been applied. Um, so this this is a you know a very interesting um, uh, uh, study uh, demonstration that was done. Uh, some of the first mapping of the brain uh, that was done, and it was done by Wilder uh, Penfield. So when we take a look at cortical sites uh, for speech, these uh, blue dots that you see here and here and over in here, those are sites in which there was a complete halting of speech as a consequence of the stimulation. The red dots, on the other hand, are sites where the stimulation disrupted speech, but it didn't block it completely. So. Uh, Penfield's research really shows that there's a very wide distribution of um, left hemisphere sites where that cortical stimulation either blocks speech um, or uh, it disrupts it. So when we take a look then at this whole idea of laterality and language, um, uh, this area that you see here in the red, uh, this is in the left frontal lobe. This is called Broca's area, important area for speech. Um, and um, <clears throat> this area that you see here in the blue, uh, in the left temporal lobe, that is uh, Wernicke's uh, area. So when you take a look at what we call Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia, um, you know, what happens when there's damage uh, either uh, to either one of these areas? Um, this really gave scientists some of the first evidence that these two areas were involved in speech and language. So, for example, <clears throat> in Broca's area, if Broca's area was damaged, pronunciation is very poor. If you take a look at the content of speech, it's mostly nouns and verbs. Uh, they omit prepositions and other grammatical uh, uh, connections. Uh, and um, there's uh, impairment in terms of comp comprehension. 
Wernicke's area, if that area is damaged, that generally pronunciation is unimpaired, um, but their grammar is nonsensical. Uh, they have a lot of difficulty finding the right word uh, in terms of naming objects, for example, and their comprehension is very seriously uh, impaired. So this was some of the first research indicating that these two areas are, are, are very important areas in terms of speech and language. One model that emerged uh, from this is something that's called the wernicke geschwin model for language. And I want you to just take a look at these uh, various brain areas. Again, this is the left uh, uh, side of the brain. Um, this is Broca's area that we see right here. This is Wernicke's area that we see right here. This is the angular gyrus that we see uh, right here. This is the primary auditory cortex, primary motor cortex that we see here. This is this pathway called the arcuate facilicus. Right? And here's uh, our primary visual cortex. So when we take a look at this model then, and we explore what is happening uh, in terms of um, the sequence of events when when uh, uh, when we respond to a heard question, and the sequence of events that occur when uh, reading words aloud. Um, these are hypothetical uh, circuits that are based upon uh, a good deal of research that, that has been done. Uh, to either a herd question, which you will see in the green, uh, or the hypothetical circuit uh, to a person who is reading aloud. So again, when we take a look at responses to a herd question, uh, here uh, we can see in this primary uh, auditory cortex, uh, there's simulation that occurs in Wernicke's uh, area uh, that we see right here. Uh, indeed, that stimulation now goes to Broca's area, and from Broca's area, it goes to the primary motor cortex. Um, in contrast, when a person is reading aloud, um, what you see is that information is first in the uh, primary visual cortex. It goes to the angular gyrus, then to Wernicke's area, then uh, uh, to Broca's area, and then to the primary uh, motor cortex uh, of the brain. So again, this is called the wernicke geschwin model, and it's a hypothetical model in terms of what happens when we respond to a heard question uh, and what happens when uh, we read aloud. So let's also now talk a little bit about the brain uh, and attention. And when we talk about attentional processes, um, you know, our, our executive controlling system, if you will, there's three primary parts uh, of this. There's the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. That's this uh, uh, orangish uh, brownish area that you see here. Um, what you see right here is the anterior cingulate cortex. That's another part of our uh, attentional system. And then the orbital frontal cortical area that you see here in, in the green. So these three areas then are ones that are involved um, in, 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 in attention. Um, Understanding attentional processes um, is uh, clearly very important for um, understanding um, behavior disorders like attention deficit disorder, or what some also refer to as attention deficit hyperactivity um, uh, disorder. Uh, when you take a look at the symptoms of ADHD, uh, you know, here are some of the primary ones. Certainly, attention deficits where you're getting this high degree of distractibility uh, and you're getting hyperactivity. Uh, these individuals are very uh, fidgety um, and there's a lot of impulsive behavior, mood swings, short temperatures, um, and um, uh, excuse me, short uh, temper, uh, high sensitive, sensitivity distress, 
uh, impaired ability to, to make and follow plans, incessant talking, they're always on the go, very disruptive in the classroom. Teachers uh, end up having to spend an awful lot of time just trying to manage uh, uh, these kids. Uh, they blurt out answers, they can't play quietly at all. So a lot of these kids are on uh, individual behavior plans and uh, um, uh, which are helpful in terms of managing their behavior in the classroom. But understanding more about the disorder, I think, is, is important. Uh, important for understanding attention, important for understanding this, uh, this particular disorder. So <clears throat> some basic facts. Um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorders affects a lot of different things. It is affecting their social behavior. It is affecting their school performance. Um, in adulthood, there's uh, problems in terms of their ability to, to handle their work uh, in their jobs. Uh, there's problems in terms of antisocial behaviors. You know, roughly three to 10% of children are uh, uh, diagnosed uh, with uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Two to three times more likely in males. So this is a, a pretty substantial gender difference where males um, uh, are diagnosed with this disorder much more so than um, our females. Um, the research in this area is complicated. It's complicated by the inability really to have any kind of reliable biomarker. Uh, there's nothing that we can point to in the brain, for example, or in terms of biochemistry, that is a 100% tip off that this is an individual that is at risk uh, for developing attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, when you uh, probe further uh, this whole idea of trying to locate a, a biomarker, one of the things that we know is that there are some structural differences in the brains of um, uh, attention deficit uh, disorder uh, individuals in normal kids. Uh, there tends to be a smaller than average prefrontal cortex and cerebellum, but again, it's nothing that is uh, consistent. There are many uh, children uh, every year, for example, that are diagnosed with um, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder that uh, their prefrontal cortex and their cerebellum is completely normal. Um, so cerebellar dysfunction is known to be associated with difficulty in uh, switching attention, switching attention from one task to uh, another task. This is something that very often you see uh, in um, an ADHD uh, child. Um, so the structural differences that you do see in the brain are relatively small. They're inconsistent between cases. Again, it's not a reliable indicator of a, of a, of a problem. Uh, uh, brain scans uh, oftentimes uh, look normal. Um, so again, it's not a reliable predictor for making um, a diagnosis. Um, so um, there's a lot of different behavioral techniques that are used uh, to try to help um, uh, ADHD uh, diagnosed kids. Um, it's oftentimes supplemented with uh, stimulant drugs. Uh, a big part of the training involves reducing distractions. Uh, getting kids to use lists and other organizational uh, practices. Um, get them involved in, um, you know, pacing themselves in a, in a, a slower uh, pace than they're ordinarily than they ordinarily want to do. Uh, get them to relax. Um, uh, you know, one thing that's been helpful uh, certainly is biofeedback training. Um, but it is not the answer uh, for, for a lot of uh, uh, kids that are diagnosed with this disorder. Um, some of the common drug treatments, certainly uh, Ritalin, um, uh, a stimulant drug uh, that has been used, amphetamines. Um, these are used oftentimes uh, in the treatment of uh, ADHD kids in combination with uh, some of those behavioral uh, practices that I mentioned earlier. Uh, 
stimulant drugs are helpful they do improve behavior they get a, get rid of a lot of these unwanted symptoms they become uh, more attentive their school performance improves their social relationships improves improve their uh, you know, impulsiveness uh, tends to go down um, but um, justifying the benefits of this uh, of uh, an individual being placed upon these drugs for a very extensive period of time. It's very complex and it's a very controversial um, issue. Um, so take a look at the actions of some of these stimulant drugs, uh, amphetamines uh, and methylphenidate. Uh, they increase uh, dopamine, the availability of dopamine uh, in postsynaptic receptors. That's principally how they're acting. The maximum benefits that you see from this are about four hours uh, after um, the drug has been ingested. Uh, and then um, this diminishes rapidly. So if you have a child, for example, that goes to school in the morning at 8 o'clock, you know, by noontime, uh, really the maximum benefits have worn off and um, uh, children can't take another pill uh, until uh, later on so this is uh, you know something that uh, has been a part of um, uh, treatment of these individuals for a long time that the kind of drug treatments that we have the stimulant drugs that we have only work for a certain period of time and then it's not possible to give uh, yet another uh, a dosage uh, of this uh, uh, without compromising the, the child in some important way so again this is a this is an important uh, consideration now here's uh, you know, I want to end this with uh, just giving you a feel for uh, controversy uh, in this area, and that controversy um, has to do with the um, development of these centers. Uh, they're called neurocore centers for brain uh, brain performance. And they uh, have been backed by this very wealthy individual who uh, is now in the United States um, in the uh, administration as uh, uh, you know the the uh, cabinet member for uh, higher uh, uh, education secretary, and uh, she has. Um, uh, invested, she and her family invested very heavily in this neural core. Uh, and it's about brain performance training, and a lot of what they use is biofeedback. And they believe that it can be very helpful for um, um, a lot of disorder situations like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and autism. Um, but in fact, the results that they obtain uh, here are, are very meager. Um, uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, rigorous kind of empirical work that needs to be done in order to support their claims. And it's expensive. And a lot of it uh, is, I believe, taking advantage of families, especially wealthy families, uh, who see this as kind of a last resort. Um, many um, uh, clinical practitioners are very skeptical um, of this uh, practice. Uh, they believe that uh, certainly things like CBT uh, can be helpful to uh, attention deficit disorder kids. But importantly, it's still something that's considered to be experimental and it's not covered by insurers. So these are things that you should keep in mind uh, and, and indeed this is a, a controversial very controversial area because there are many parents that are out there that are seeking help uh, for their kids um, in terms of uh, treatment uh, for ADHD so our conclusions then you know certainly we have um, non-pharmacological treatments uh, that we can use for uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. There's also drug treatments we can use, amphetamines, for example. Um, but one of the one of the things that really holds us back uh, in terms of making a more substantial progress is really the absence of a reliable biomarker.
uh, something that we can point to and say hey yes this this person has uh, let's say an enlarged uh, frontal cortex that definitely means that they're going to be at risk for ADHD. But we can't do that, uh, nor do we have anything in terms of the biochemistry of the brain, for example, uh, or size of the brain. We just don't have a reliable biomarker. Perhaps we will at some point, but right now that really prevents us from making more definitive kinds of um, uh, assessments. Uh, as well as providing um, uh, solutions uh, to to this type of uh, disorder. So that brings us to a close for this lecture and what uh, we will be doing uh, in our next uh, lecture is we'll be taking a look at uh, some you know some controversial areas in this whole area of the treatment of behavior disorders, biological uh, treatment. Um, so we'll take a look at that then uh, in uh, our next uh, lecture.